So I am here mainly to talk to you about, about some of your work and research into the brain and neuroscience and the ideas of, of neuro rights. So I was, I was looking at some of your stuff um, over the past week or two, and I was interested in this idea that you have that there is potentially a difference between learning and practice in terms of how the brain uh, functions and, and processes it. So do you want to like start by giving us an example or a, or a definition of neurologically speaking, what is learning and, and what is practice? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, just to take a step back, I mean, we, we were, we, you know, on the science side, our lab's very much interested in modal learning and, and, and in particular in skill acquisition. Uh, and then what that leads to is, well, what's the difference between being a, having a skill versus being a true expert? And, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, as you know, kind of bastardized, if I may say, the 10,000 hours rule taken from a psychologist, very famous one, who died recently, Anders Ericsson, who had been extremely interested in how you become an expert through practice. Okay. Now, where that gets complicated is that if you want to be an expert violinist or chess player, and he studied violinists and chess players, that's years and years and years, right, to become an expert. Whereas if you're a neuroscientist in a lab, you can't do experiments that last years. Right. So you study more simplified tasks in the lab where you can say that someone gets skilled at that task, but it usually takes hours, if not days, maybe weeks. Okay. So you have the whole psychology and neuroscience of skill in more short-lived lab-based tasks. And yet there's an abyss, it seemed, between that and the huge amount of time it takes through practice to become an expert who makes the big bucks of your basketball player or a musician or anything like that. Do you see? So in other words, that led to seeing people saying, well, maybe there's a difference between sort of the learning that you do in a lab to get a skill that takes a short period of time versus the special thing that happens if you practice for years to become an expert. And indeed, Anders Ericsson in his work distinguished between practicing something short term and the deliberative practice you need to learn something long-term. And to be very honest with you, the science of that difference is not fully understood, right? It, it's, there's a gap and we haven't crossed it yet. I hope that made sense. You know, it does. So when you're trying to study this, when you're looking at different parts of the brain that are say activating when you're practicing this or, or you doing a particular movement is the same part of the brain being used when you are say first trying that movement or skill as it is once it becomes like a more built in like to use yeah the, yeah know, right, use the right muscle memory is maybe not the right term but you know what i'm getting at yeah muscle so we can talk about that right so what you're talking about is something that has been of huge interest is this notion of automatizing things that first, and I always give this example, I think it helps, you know, the first time, let's say you have a six digit ATM number, right? And the first time you go up to the ATM, you have it in your head, you go, okay, this is my number. And you somewhat slowly type out the number, but you know, a few weeks later, you don't even have to think about it. Your finger just flies across the keyboard and you're doing it. And actually just to tell you how distinct this is, is when it was six digit ATM numbers before everyone switched to four digit ATM numbers, I would actually, when I traveled to Europe from the United States and the configuration of the keyboard in European banks is different from the configuration of the keyboard in American banks. So I would actually no longer know my ATM number. My finger couldn't do it. And I had forgotten the actual explicit number. In other words, I'd automatized to the point that I no longer knew my number. So I would actually have to pull up on my phone a American ATM, type out on the American ATM on my phone, learn the number again, and then apply it to the ATM keyboard in Europe. So that is a very stark representation of the fact that you can have an explicit, slow, deliberative version, 
and then it automatizes, right? Um, now, people have been extremely interested in knowing, well, what is the neural basis, the brain basis for that transition? And the, the, the answer, the honest answer is we don't really know, right? Uh, certainly the sort of canned story is that the more deliberative thinking based parts of your brain, your prefrontal cortex lights up when you're doing that deliberative stage. And then that begins to die down and you begin to see activation both in premotor and motor cortical areas and in subcortical areas when you automatize. Um, quite frankly, I think that that story is a, a placeholder at the moment. Um, I don't think that we really have a proper bead on it, um, but it's probably true that there are differential weightings of parts of the brain as you make that transition from the deliberative slow phase uh, to the overt, uh, the, the overt phase to the automatic phase. And there's been huge arguments that the best athletes are just automatized robots. They're not thinking, right? That you've just automatized everything and that's why you're good. And I think that's entirely incorrect. Um, I have been interviewed most um, explicitly was in 2013 when a journalist was writing a cover story for Time Magazine on LeBron James and wanted to call LeBron James a genius and called me several times concerned, was he allowed to call LeBron James a genius because wasn't he just a giant automatized set of muscle memories that you shouldn't use the word genius for an athlete, unlike for you know Mozart or Emily Dickinson or Einstein. And um, the point I'm making is not just an opinion, it's based on the neuroscience. That's entirely incorrect. That just because you have automatized bits doesn't mean you don't also have thinking bits, right? So LeBron James is always strategizing and thinking and picking and solving at the same time that he can marshal his automatic bits. And that's true of a mathematician, that's true of a musician, it's true of an athlete. It's this perfect combination of your cached automatic policies combined with ongoing deliberation. And in fact, if you see someone like a Nadal being interviewed after a match, he remembers every single point and every single decision that he made. He's more cognizant of what's going on, mm. right? So yes, people study that transition. Do we really understand it? No. Uh, but in the end, when you become expert, it's because you can mix up thinking and doing in this way. So you're saying that, that that's that's an interesting concept that 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 sort of hyper focus or even arguably or you know purportedly automatized decision making movement is is actually making them more aware of what's going on as they do it. Because I don't know. Sometimes when you watch, say, like sports documentaries about um, like basketball or football or uh, or a tennis or any anything like that, and you see the the players discuss the the the, the movements that they made in these crucial seconds of a game that took place forty years ago, and they remember it like it like it's right precisely, there, like it was yesterday. Exactly. Exactly. In other words, they're more nerdy, right? And it's precisely because they've automatized the lower level bits that they can free up their thinking for the higher level bits. So for example, you know, I take squash lessons until COVID and, you know, I would be worrying about my foot placement and the nature of my backhand. That's where I was focusing my thinking. So I couldn't think about the next point ahead or what my opponent was doing or what was the Nate, you know, the ball was hotter that day because it was a hot day. Mm. Whereas the squash coach could do, because it, he had all those lower level things completely cached and automatized, he could devote his thinking to higher level things. Right? Mm. So in other words, just like this conversation, I mean, you're not worrying about how your lips work and how they uh, pronounce the words that you're wanting to say. 
they just automatically come out and you can just think about what it is you want to say. But if you had to suddenly start worrying about how do I coordinate my lips and my tongue to say that word, I can assure you your thoughts would just shut down. I mean, not I am thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, in other words, it's precisely because you've got these things automatized that you can actually devote yourself to thinking. And that's the way I think you want to think about expertise. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.